President, this week marks the 250th anniversary of the first blow struck in the American colony's struggle for independence from the British Crown. I come to the Senate floor every year to commemorate this moment because it took place in Rhode Island at the hands of some brave and bold Rhode Islanders. Before recounting the tale of those bold Rhode Islanders, I would like to acknowledge a special guest with us in the gallery today, Michael Tatham, Deputy Head of Mission for the British Embassy here in Washington. A lot has happened over the last 250 years, and Great Britain is now America's closest ally and great, great friend. It is an honor to have the Deputy Ambassador here today. So, it was 1772, and the Royal Navy's revenue cutter, the HMS Gatsby, patrolled Narragansett Bay in the wake of the Seven Years' War, where Great, Brit Great Britain had emerged the victor, the crown owed, by some estimates, between 74 and 133 million pounds. That was a colossal burden on the empire's finances. The Gaspee's mission was to collect taxes from the colonies to help repay British debt. I will concede that part of the Gaspee's mission was righteous. Rhode Island's rum distilleries formed a corner of the so-called triangle trade with enslaved people from Africa and sugar from the Caribbean forming the other legs of this foul business. Rum running to support the slave trade was repugnant and a worthy target of British authorities. But Britain's heavy hand reached far beyond that. British customs agents seized colonial vessels and cargo at whim, leaving rightful owners with no recourse to reclaim their property. One such owner was John Hancock, whose signature would soon become famous. Authorities even pressed colonial sailors into service on His Majesty's vessels against their will. The Gaspi and her captain, Lieutenant William Duddingston, drew particular ire. One of Duddingston's first acts was to stop the merchant ship Fortune. Duddingston and his crew roughed up the Fortune's commander, Rufus Green, condemned the ship and her cargo, and sent the Fortune to Boston for the Admiralty to sell. This did not please the Fortune's owner, Rhode Island's Nathaniel Green, who would go on to become General Washington's aide-de-camp and wartime administrator, and then command the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War, which he did so effectively that British General Cornwallis would write, that damned Green is more dangerous than Washington. Duddingston's reputation only worsened from there. British law awarded revenue cutter commanders a share of the cargo they seized. Duddingston seized so much cargo that he was able to nearly double his salary. And he earned, along with that bounty, a well-deserved reputation for arrogance. Soon, Rhode Islanders were protesting his conduct formally, but those protests yielded no accommodation. On June 9, 1772, simmering anger at Duddingston and the Gaspi boiled over. Duddingston spotted a small trading ship, the Hannah, bound for Providence. The Gaspee gave chase, and Duddingston hailed 
the Hannah's captain, Benjamin Lindsay, and ordered the Hannah to submit to a search. Captain Lindsay declined that invitation and ignored the Gatsby's warning shots and sailed on toward Providence. Now the Hannah was smaller and lighter than the Gatsby. And Captain Lindsay was more familiar than Duddingston with the waters between Newport and Providence. Lindsay steered his Hannah across the shallow waters outside Namquid Point. The Hannah could sail over the shallows, but the heavier Gatsby could not. Duddingston and his crew ran aground on a sandbar off Patuxet Cove, stranded as the sun was setting in a falling tide. The Gatsby would need to wait for the next day's high tides to lift it free. When the Hannah arrived in Providence, Captain Lindsay summoned local patriots to Sabin's Tavern for refreshments and for planning. The result of the plan was that under the leadership of John Brown, later to be famous for Brown University, and Abraham Whipple, a group of men boarded a half dozen longboats to row from Providence down to Patuxet. Through the dark night, with oars muffled, the Rhode Islanders descended upon the Gaspe. Whipple reputedly called out to Duddingston, and I hope the young pages will forgive my language, but this is apparently the language used in that moment. I am the sheriff of the county of Kent, God damn you. I have got a warrant to apprehend you, God damn you. So surrender, God damn you. I believe I mentioned that the Rhode Islanders had fortified themselves at Sabin's Tavern, which might explain some of the language. In any event, Lieutenant Duddingston refused that invitation. So a brief, sharp battle ensued. At this moment, those 250 years ago, Rhode Islanders drew the first blood of what would become our revolutionary struggle when a musket ball struck Lieutenant Duddingston. The Rhode Island Patriots boarded the Gatsby. In the melee, Duddingston cried out, Lord, have mercy upon me, I am done for. But he was not. The British sailors soon gave up the fight. The Rhode Islanders took the crew prisoner and ferried the captives to shore. A marker still stands at the place where the captive crew was brought ashore. And there, Duddingston received the care of a doctor and ultimately recovered from his wounds. Indeed, Duddingston would not only heal, but go on to live a long life. He commanded other vessels. He moved back to his native Scotland and married and raised four children in a coastal town called Ely, overlooking the Firth of Fife and the North Sea. But he never patrolled Narragansett Bay again. A quick side story, a few years ago, a couple from Scotland, Angela and Roddy Innes, visited Patuxet during Gatsby Days, our annual celebration of the Gatsby Raid, coming up this weekend. The Innes's are connected through marriage to the Duddingstons. And Angela wanted to see what the Duddingston Gatsby saga was all about. In Patuxet, Rhode Islanders welcomed Angela and Roddy with open arms. Local historian Dr. John Concannon invited them to stay. It was an amazing experience, Angela said. The people there are incredibly friendly. The trip also helped them grasp the significance of the Gatsby Raid on America's road to revolution. And this year, Angela Innes 
will mark the 250th Gatsby anniversary with a Gatsby Day party of her own in Scotland. Well, that left the dreaded Gatsby. <clears throat> with the prisoners ashore, the Gatsby raiders returned to the stranded ship and set her afire. When the fire reached her powder magazine, she blew apart and her remains were lost to time and tides. Rhode Island was rid of the dread Gatsby. Now, new efforts are underway to find the charred remains of the Gatsby using advanced sonar technology. Dr. Kathy Abbas of the Rhode Island Marine Archaeology Project is on the case. Dr. Abbas is accomplished in her field. Indeed, she may have located Captain Cook's ship, the Endeavor, sunk in Newport Harbor. If anyone can find the Gatsby, or what's left of her, it's Dr. Abbas. I should offer special thanks to Peter Abbott, the British Consul General in Boston, who, along with representatives of the Royal Navy, came to Rhode Island last month for the announcement that funds had been raised to find the Gatsby. Abbott said, being a British consul in New England means you must have broad shoulders. I get invited to events that celebrate the Boston Massacre and Evacuation Day. But what takes the biscuit is commemorating the burning of a British ship. The deputy ambassador should know that if, in fact, we do find the Gatsby, Rhode Island, a colony no more, intends to courteously seize the vessel for further research. Mr. President, the Gatsby Raid represents Rhode Island's spirit of independence, which has lived in us since Rhode Island's founding as a refuge of religious tolerance from the Massachusetts colony's harsh theocracy. Our celebration of the Gatsby Affair represents Rhode Islanders' pride in that spirit, which we share willingly, even with a Duddingston descendant. Oh, and by the way, this episode, where Rhode Islanders rode down through the night to a British ship that had been stranded by Rhode Island wilds, and sacked her and took her crew and set her afire and blew her up, that all took place more than a year before Massachusetts colonists boarded a British ship to push tea bales into Boston Harbor. They pushed tea bales off the ship. More than a year earlier, Rhode Islanders blew the ship up. I'm just saying, Mr. President. So here's to another 250 years of celebrating the Gatsby Raiders and to more people learning about Rhode Island's role as a spark of revolution. I yield the floor.